And uh, this year, believe it or not, brace yourself, but it marks the 50th anniversary since Angus and Malcolm Young decided to put a band together in Sydney. Since then, in those 50 years, they have rewritten the rock rule book without going off and doing prog or jazz impro or something involving King Arthur and his Knights of the Bleeding Round Table. And they also happen to have written one of the best LPs ever called Back in Black, which is cited by everybody who's got an opinion as one of the most definitive moments in rock and roll history. Here to tell us more about that and other things, the author of For Those About to Rock is Paul Elliott. Paul, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, John. Pretty, I mean, that is ACDC, a band like no other. They haven't really changed their style, which goes to prove that if it ain't, if it ain't broken, it's working, don't fiddle with it. No, they've never changed their style. I mean, they did actually do a ballad on their very first Australian release, and I know that's a shock to uh, people who haven't probably dug as deep into the band as someone as sad and as sensitive as I have. But, yeah, it was actually called Love Song, and it was a, a nice tune for a little ditty sung quite, quite sweetly by Bon Scott, but they soon decided that that... Uh, was a one-off aberration and just stuck to what they do best. Yeah, I think the, the, the love ballads of Bon Scott, you know, it would be a very short term. I mean, anybody, anybody who sings a whole lot of Rosie, I mean, Bon, bon had a voice that was matured in whiskey and, 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 and hard living in cigarettes, didn't he, basically? Yes, he did, and which is why when you've had a guy like Bon and sadly he passed away in 1980 and you're looking for a replacement, it's a miracle, really, that they found Brian Johnson, who couldn't have been more perfect for the band. And, I mean, Angus has always jokingly said that Brian sings like somebody just dropped a truck on his foot. But, you know, that works for ACDC. What more could you want? And if anyone ever had the hardest job to start in a new band, as Brian did coming into the Back in Black album, I mean, it's just, it's the greatest comeback in the entire history of rock and roll. It's the second biggest selling album of all time after Michael Jackson's Thriller. And um, in many ways, it's Brian's album. It's such a victorious opening to his ACDC career. And it's just, even when you listen back to any track on it now, his performance is phenomenal. And it's pretty remarkable that he's still belling out those songs now in his 70s. But when you go back to the, the let's go back before it because there is the, that that album hits like out of nowhere and it is the, the 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 greatest rock and roll comeback of all time. But if you look at the catalogue of work from from Dirty Deeds, uh, Done But Cheap, the Dirt Cheap, you know, High, you know, uh, Power Age, all those other albums, if you want blood, you've got it. They're an incredible body of work, and and not only that, but and I was discussing this with, with, with some friends. If you were an Australian band in the 70s, to get over to break Europe, you had to be incredibly good. And the amount of touring and live gigs they'd done before they even inflicted themselves on an unsuspecting UK was phenomenal. And that is why they made such an impact. Yeah, I mean, they've, uh, this, this is quite well documented in their history and in the, in the, in the book I've, I've had uh, written. Um, you know, they, they, but they had learned the hard way in Australia. They were playing pubs where, you know, they'd have chicken wire in front of the stage because people would be throwing bottles. And, and Angus, you know, I do believe he did tell me this in an interview for Kerrang. He said that, you know, back in back in those days, he was so nervous in his schoolboy outfit that they persuaded him was the right way to go. It will be an image that everyone will remember. But you think about that audience and the chicken wire, and then you think about going out there dressed as a little schoolboy. You are going to be nervous. And he said, you know, he said he remembers Malcolm right behind him saying, "Don't worry, you know, you get out there. We're right behind you," and just booting him in the bum. And on he, he was on. You know, he was on stage now, and he said they. He looked at that audience that one night and thought they looked like the, you know, like convicts, murderers row, convicts waiting for blood. They want blood. And so the whole thing, if you want blood, kind of really does sum up their gladiatorial approach to, to live performance. I mean, where, does, where did the schoolboy outfit come from, by the way? I mean, who's because, I mean, you know, rock, rock and roll bands and heavy rock bands and you know, hard rock bands weren't, weren't kind of dressing up like that, and especially as, you know, as schoolboys, and especially in Oz in the 70s. Mm. Well, it was his uh, Angus, his own uniform from Ashfield Boys uh, Comprehensive School that he went to, and how they decided that it would be the you know a great idea to do that. But you got to remember, ACDC in those very early days was were wearing kind of glam rock gear. Um, they had a frontman before Bon Scott joined, who was 
very flamboyant, very sort of uh, in that kind of Slade sweet kind of thing. He really thought he was a, a pop star. So they, you know, they flirted with that as all bands do when they're finding their image. But um, what they ended up with, though, is that, you know, you've got the little hyperactive schoolboy running around like crazy. And then you've got Bond, the sort of hard man with a little wink in his eye, sort of piratical kind of figure. Um, so you had the really cool front man and then you had the crazy Angus running around, and it just seemed to work. And obviously, all the other guys just stayed at the back of the stage, just yeah. pumping out those riffs. And it it just worked. It, you know, it made an incredible impact when they first came over here. And it, I mean, people who don't know just think that Malcolm was sitting at the back just doing three chords, but he was keeping an eye on it all. And he was, you know, along with Angus, he was the driving force. Was, but when we lost him, it was like, okay, what do ACDC do now? But you know, in those early days and in those halcyon days of late seventies through the eighties, I mean, he was he was the man, wasn't he? He allowed them to to be so expressive. Yeah, Malcolm was definitely the driving, the sole driving force. He was the boss of that band always, um, and you know, he stayed back, he stayed out of the limelight. I mean, I was very surprised in uh, for me doing a job in around about two thousand and three when I went out for do a piece for Q magazine and and. I was expecting to just get Angus or Angus and Brian, but it was Angus, Brian and Malcolm doing this interview together. And it was quite a thrill for me to sort of, I'd interviewed the other guys before, but to have Malcolm there. And he was actually really funny. Um, they all were. I mean, it was such a riotous interview because it was readers' questions. What do you, what do the fans want to know? So there were some really funny things in there. And, um, you know, someone, one of the questions was like, you know, what do you think of Britney Spears wearing a school outfit, you know, in uh, Hit Me Baby One More Time? And is that kind of encroaching on your territory? You know, that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, Malcolm was, so he was a, he was a tough customer, a hard taskmaster, but definitely, you know, he, he was the guy that had the vision to make that band musically what it was. I mean, what, I mean, Bon Scott dies, what, 1980, 7980, um, in London, after these phenomenal gigs and everybody's getting very, very excited about him. They're, they're the big thing in rock. Uh, what, where were they at that point then? I mean, because it would have been easy to say, right, that's it, you know, we give up. Or did they realise that they were on the cusp of going even, even bigger? Because obviously Bon was such a a character, this sort of theoretical pixie. They've just been doing really, I mean, there's great pictures of him in the States as well, doing gigs there. So they were kind of getting, doing well over there as well. Um, we had this interesting sort of new rock coming over with the, you know, of the Maidens and the Def Leppards. You had Van Halen doing, breaking in, in, um, in the States as well, plus in Europe. It was a really interesting time for the new bands in, in, in heavy metal. Mm. I mean, it was a great time. Well, for, for me, that was exactly the point when I started getting into rock music via a Thin Lizzy album that my uncle take for me, and and there was no way back from there. And so it was like 1979. So these things are all happening. And I do remember that... So ACDC, they got to the point with Highway to Hell, what turned out to be Bond's last album. Uh, that was their first million seller in America. And it was a really big moment because they brought in a really great producer, Robert John Mutt Langer. Um, and basically this was a guy that knew how to make hit records or knew how to put just enough polish onto ACDC to get them on the radio, to make, you know, all those choruses that you hear. In the past, they'd have a gang vocal on something like Dirty Deeds and it just like sounded like a bunch of drunks. Yeah, three guys in a pub, isn't it? Yeah. Out time, yeah. yeah. Whereas with Mutt, you can hear his voice in those choruses. High with a hell when you get to choruses like that. It was huge. It made such a great sound. So after having a bit of a struggle in selling records, I mean, Dirty Deeds wasn't even released in America because the label Atlantic thought it was too uncommercial. So and then they get to the point where they've got their first million seller. They are on that cusp of greatness. And they had started tracking a few songs for Backing Black demoing it with Bond playing drums because he used to be a drummer, started off playing at a pipe band in Scotland, uh, carried on with his knack of playing drums, he used to play drums in bands before ACDC. So they were working on a couple of tracks and there is a famous quote from Bon, he rung his mum back in Australia and said, this is going to be the big one, that we know this is, this is so great, this album's going to be so great. But of course... By the time they, just a few days after they finish up the Highway to Hell tour, and that's when Bond died, 
And um, obviously it's devastating, like you said, a character that big, uh, a phenomenal. It's like anybody, any band that loses a lead singer, whether they have died, whether they've quit, whether you've kicked them out like Black Sabbath did with Ozzy Osbourne, it's still a huge thing to change. Uh, you know, uh, one of the guys from Survivor, I the Tiger, Jim, mm. once said to me, there's few bands that survive a lead singer transplant, but amazingly, ACDC got the perfect guy and just became the biggest rock band in the world. Yeah, I mean, because was it Geordie, his previous group? Was that uh, Brian's band? Yeah, yeah, they were a glam rock band yeah. as well from, uh, from up north, obviously, Geordie. Um, and they just were playing in the pub circuit. And, you know, Brian was, you know, that band had split up. Brian was doing nothing. He had a car. He had a business um, in Newcastle where he was I mean, putting vinyl rooms on cars. He thought his time in the spotlight had gone. And, uh, you know, he wasn't even looking. He was, he was amazed when he got uh, the call from management for ACDC saying, do you want to come down and do an audition for us? And the only reason he agreed, he was so broke at the time, the only, the only one condition on which he would do the, uh, the audition for ACDC was he would do it on a day when he could also do a commercial for Hoover on the same day. So that would pay for his journey. And he did sing me the jingle that he recorded once when we were talking about it. I said, how did it go? And he went, it's the new Groover from Hoover. What a mover. <laughs> so um, maybe somebody can find that somewhere on YouTube. But um, that, yeah, that's how broken down on his luck Brian Johnson was. So the fact that he uh, he ended up in in ACDC. He used to sing, you know, in in the in the in the clubs. He used to sing a whole lot of Rosie because it was such a big song. And then he ends up in the, you know, it's almost amazing that he ends up there. And as Joe Elliott, the singer from Def Leppard, memorably told me once, Brian Johnson jumped on a winning horse as it was crossing the finishing line. You know, it, they were ready. They had those songs. They needed the right guy to sing them. And then the magic happens. So, yeah, it's a wonderful story. But you know when there's an album that comes out and it absolutely crosses all the boundaries? You don't have to be... Because, you know, you can say, oh, you, know, you get people walking around with Nirvana T-shirts who don't know what Nirvana is sort of thing. But it's the, you know, it's, it's the 80s. We haven't had big hair metal yet, thank goodness. But it, it's an album that drops just at the right time, you know, between that sort of end of... Between New Wave... Uh, and the new, uh, I mean, I'm talking sort of Elvis Costello, Blondie's that lot, and the new wave of British metal, and suddenly everybody is buying this album, and I remember the excitement of people saying, have you heard this album? And just that opening, and we're off. And, and it just opened up the floodgates to a, to a whole new audience that I don't think had ever come across ADC, ACDC before, maybe Highway to Hell, but suddenly it was everywhere. Yeah, it was, a, it was, I mean, it's a perfectly recorded album, you know, the brilliant production that is, it's just all the power of the band is in that. The songs are amazing. Even the fillers, if you want to call them fillers, like have a drink on me, they're still amazing songs. And the band just played a couple of really, well, on an album as big as that, you don't really have so much deep cuts, but they played a couple when they played at the Power Trip Festival last weekend. So they dug out, they they delivered a set which a lot of people were blown away by because there was, you know, have a drink on me, giving the dog a bone um, about Brian's pet Labrador, so they, so they used to say. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was a phenomenal record. The weird thing about it is for an album as big as that, I mean, Thriller being the biggest selling album of all time, it's actually packed with hits. I mean, virtually every track on it was released as a single there aren't really any hit songs look catchy little numbers maybe you shoot me all night long but the rest of it is pretty pounding hard rock screaming vocals it's not in any way like a commercial driven album but somehow it just connected it was that good that it just kept growing and growing and i can still remember the moment when i heard it as a kid I was on holiday with my parents. I was about 12 or 13. And I couldn't wait to get back from Corfu because I knew that Back in Black was coming out. And I just got on my bike, pedaled round to my mate's house. He said, wait till you hear this. He got it. So it was on a cassette. Yeah. On it went. The bell started ringing. And I thought, "What? what's going on here? And then as soon as the first guitar lick came in, well, I was sold. And it will always be... For me, the greatest album of all time, no question. And also, it, the thing about something like Back in Black, it becomes a theme track to you. It becomes a soundtrack to your life. 
I, you know, I will always remember, listen, you know, bombing down from London to Petersfield with, in an MG with that on, you know, on, on the soundtrack on a Friday night heading out of London and, and having that on full pelt, you know, going past Devil's Punch Bowl and just all of us like five guys screaming their heads off, which we shouldn't have been five in an MG, but anyway. You were on my manor there, so I'm far on you see, ah, so okay. well, I, I know that area well. We, well, all, yeah, we yes. almost ended up in a field at one point, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, but yes, bombing around, I mean, what a great album to drive a car to, you know what I mean, just pumping it out. I do, I do remember when I was, you know, taking my driving test, I wanted to pass my test for the specific goal of driving around my boring little hometown with the windows down, blasting out, ACDC, Van Halen, etc. So yeah, what could be better on a, I mean, on a Friday night or whatever it is to, to just you know crank that one up. And I always say this about rock fans: is that they're the most loyal fans in the world. Rock fans, if they like you, they will stick with you as long as you don't go too much off the scale. And the thing with ACDC is they've always seemed, you know, they have an amazing rapport with their fans, the connection. I mean, when they play Spain, when they play Madrid, the place goes absolutely because obviously we're massive rockers here in Spain as well. And they've always had that connection and they've never done showbiz showbiz. Uh, they've never, you know, they've never seemed to, to flounce or flout. They've just had that sort of blue collar look, uh, you know, all the way through. Yeah, they are. I mean, you know, Brian Johnson, it's, it's, you look at him and he's just, well, Angus, all of them. I mean, they're amazingly small, all of them, which is quite weird. Um, and, uh, you know, absolutely tiny. And then once they get up on stage, they're these kind of like superheroes. And it's really weird because just before they're going on, it's famously known that they're just sitting there, you know, having a few, smoking a few roll ups, maybe playing darts. Um, and then on they go, Angus T. Total. He's not the rock and roll cliche. Um, they, are, you know, they, they were, they've got this, like you said, it's a working class attitude to it. Even though they're so phenomenally successful, um, they, they were never about, um, like when you said all the, all the big hair that comes into rock yeah. music in the late 80s, they just stayed and did their thing. And for a time, they were deeply unfashionable because. Nobody was really that bothered about it because they were just making, uh, you know, for the rest of the eighties after Back in Black and maybe for those about the rock, it tails off. They're not they're not as great as they used to be, but you could always count on ACDC to have one or two or maybe three absolutely great songs on every album. So when you get the, the catalogue keeps building because yeah. it's adding in new anthems like Thunderstruck oh, along oh. the way. Yeah. You know, and Rock and Roll Train, I still remember when I first heard that, I went, that's exactly what an ACDC song should sound like. So they have kept the standards high, and it's, that's, that's why people keep coming back. 1989-1990, New Year's Eve, Orange Square in Marbella, where everybody meets, and somebody started singing Thunderstruck, and, you know, nah, 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 and suddenly the whole of the square is doing Thunderstruck on New Year's Eve, and then it goes, oh, you, you walk down to the port, and I will always remember there's pictures of us giving it Thunderstruck, but obviously cause it, we call it Chunderstruck because it was New Year's Eve and we are all drinking far too much. <laughs> I'm sure they would have appreciated that. Exactly. I mean, one thing that I've always found is that, you know, there's always that, that old cliché, you don't want to meet your heroes. Yeah. But um, for me, you know, being I was in the ACDC fan club after I'd heard Back in Black, I've always loved them. They've always been, I think, there are certain bands that are very important to me. There's Thin Lizzy, there's the Rolling Stones, etc. Van Halen, Led Zeppelin. But when it really comes down to it, who's, whose music I've had the most enjoyment out of in my long life. And it's it's got to be ACDC. And there's something about, I say, that connection... So when I say about Back in Black not having these kind of pop hits, but what they are is rock anthems. Yeah. So when you get to Back in Black, Hell's Bell, Shoot to Thrill, Rock and Roll Ain't Noise Pollution, You Shoot Me All Night Long, they are monumental. So they're not just ACDC classics, they are rock classics. And that's what they've got. You look at any set list, you also know that ACDC are going to deliver what you want every time you see them. They are going to give you all of those aforementioned checks and a whole lot of rosy, let them be rock. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal when they get into that latter half of the set. And um, the fact that they've just done a, a performance in a power trip in California. And what was that, power trip, by the way? Because I mean, a lot of people won't know exactly what that was. Power Trip is a new festival, extortionately expensive. I mean, some of the tickets were $1,500 for a three day event. 
but it was six bands, but they were all huge bands. So day one is Iron Maiden first, Guns N' Roses second, as in after headlining. Okay. Yeah? Then the next night was ACDC with Judas Priest as the opening act. Oh. And then on the third day, it was Tool as the opening act and Metallica as the headliners. And one thing that was wonderful about it, there is some footage that's gone around already of Kirk and James from Metallica in the kind of photo pit at the front of the stage while Judas Priest are on, and bless them, they're air guitaring to Judas Priest. These guys, these multi-millionaire superstars of heavy metal are still those kids when they're watching a band they love, such as Judas Priest. But there they are, James Hanfield, air guitaring, singing his head off. You know, they're still fans in that moment, which is great to see. So Power Trip was a, a massive event that was so expensive that you wonder whether they could ever do it again. I mean, obviously, because they had to pay all of those big fans yeah, as well. And ACDC, I can assure you, are not cheap. Um, so just to pay for ACDC costs a lot, of, but there you go. They're the working class guys whose management and everything drive a really hard bargain. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a successful event, but ACDC performance was hailed by many as... Um, a monumental event. A guy I know who works for Universal, uh, senior vice president of Universal, he's a Brit out there. He said it's in his top five performances of all time. So who am I to argue? Yeah, I mean, like I said before, they because they've done the hard yards, they've done the touring, and they've got the they've got the tracks. It's not a bad an ACDC set list. There's not there's not going to be a bad one on it, is there? No, no, and it's been that way for so long, and so eventually some staples of the live set drop out mm. but it's because they've got a few other new ones but they've carried on there's always at least like i say one on every album that you think yeah that'll be in who was drumming by the way well a guy called matt Lau, okay. who uh so a little known um the, the my understanding is that phil rudd acdc's drummer is unable or well, not permitted to enter the united states because of the mm. criminal charge that he was defending himself against um, some years ago yeah. so whether that is a permanent arrangement or not who's to say but really what you want and the one thing that's great about acdc providing that phil still is in the band you know aside from this one performance is the it's the best lineup of ACDC you could possibly hope for at this juncture with Malcolm gone. Yeah. You have Stevie, their cousin on rhythm guitar. You've got Angus, Brian, Cliff Williams, and Phil Rudd, which is four fifths of the lineup that made Back in Black. So that's good enough for me. Good what enough was, for anyone. Yeah, absolutely. What was uh, what's it like revisiting this one? Because you, you, this was originally out a couple. Of, was it about a few years ago um, for those about to rock? And you've revamped it and put some more. There's been some some updates, yeah. as it were. Yeah, we've updated it. We've added a, a, another chapter to include the Power Up album, um, and you know, up, up to the modern day. I mean, obviously, it had to be delivered, so it's it doesn't clearly include a review of their performance at Power Trip because nobody had uh, knew that was coming at the time when the when the copy was submitted but yeah we've we 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 left the story sort of hanging at the point where we know they're going to be back but there was nothing certainly I had a word with a few people quite high up in the music business to make sure that um background information I said I won't quote you but I need to know what you think mm. they are going to be doing and my understanding from those conversations is that ACDC won't tour like they used to uh, because Brian just is not, yeah. uh, you know, you can't do two hours a night of screeching like that and then do it the next night. He's not 25 anymore. So they will do probably huge events like they've just done a power trip. Maybe I could imagine them doing kind of a, well, maybe the same venues that someone like the Eagles do or yeah. Springsteen. So you do three or four football stadiums in the UK, and maybe, I don't know, three days apart one week apart, play like that. But if that's the the basis on which we have, what we have to accept, then that's the realities. I mean, the fact that he's got his back, his voice back, because you know it's great that they can call in guest singers, but you want Brian. You don't want it to be ACDC featuring whoever they've got, you know, uh, who's, you know, Axl Rose or... Because it gets into that sort of Queen situation, doesn't it, where you're, you're bringing in guest vocalists and you want to have that original voice. I mean, they're all, you know, mid-70s now, so... They've got to look after it, and, and but to have that, as you said, the four fifths of the lineup is a, is a thing of beauty. Um, 
next couple, as you said, next couple of years, we'll, we'll see where it develops with that. What do you hope that people who, who haven't discovered ACDC, there are a few of the parallel, there are some tribes that haven't been discovered on islands. Uh, what do you think they're going to, you know, if you're an ACDC fan, you're going to see quotes you haven't seen before, memorabilia, bits and pieces to fill in the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 when I was off, offered the, the deal for the book, I mean, you know, it was one of those things where you just go, do I want to write a book about my favourite band? And you mm-hmm. kind of go, well, that's an offer you can't refuse. Um, but when, the one thing that everybody who's ever written a book about ACDC will know is that you'll get zero cooperation from the band. And that's not because they're not pleasant to deal with. Um, it's just the management, etc. They don't let any outsiders in. They don't do so. You know that it's going to be an unofficial book, but it's done with a great amount of love, as you, I'm sure, you can gauge from this conversation we're having. You know, um, I've spent a lot of my time in my life listening to ACDC, so I try to put as much into it that I think ACDC fans would enjoy, and whether that's honest appraisals of the less great albums, because let's not kid ourselves. You know, not every album can is as great as. I would have held Power Age back in black. But then let's focus on the great stuff. Let's let's really bring it out. So there are interviews, this material interviews that I've done for many, uh, interview material for many times that I've interviewed them. And uh, a lot of, I suppose the most important thing is that it's, it's erring on the side of, of just loving the band. And you know, who's going to read a book about ACDC? People who love ACDC. So I hope that they will understand that what is your favorite because you've been doing this for a while you know and writing mm. for the krang which was the bible thank you very much religiously um and let us all be thankful they never had a big hair day a la coverdale but so mm. what is your favorite memory you could, you could share with the listeners about acdc away from you know away from what we might have seen because you've interviewed them over the years yeah i mean if i go back to that interview with with um with the three of them angus brian and malcolm one thing that was great about it is that you go into a room we were in berlin and they played a little show they were going to open for the rolling stones in in um and they were playing the stones had been booked into things like airfields right so you could get about two or two hundred thousand in but the tickets weren't selling that well so what they did was they went who's gonna who can we get on now, if you're in playing in Germany, ACDC could probably set out those venues. So, of course, ACDC hadn't opened for anyone since, I don't know when, you know, 1979 or something, when they were lowered down on a bill. They are a top billing act and always have been. Um, but they agreed to do it, and they obviously played for an hour. But what we had the joy of was when we went to me and a couple of other journalists, Jerry Ewing, Dave Ling, we were there together, all working for different magazines, and... They played a warm-up show in Berlin, and it was a place about 1,500-seater, and we couldn't quite believe ACDC were going to come on. We were waiting. We'd had a few drinks, and then we saw this lit end of a cigarette just weaving around and then settling behind the drum kit, and you went, okay, now I believe it. And on they came, and they played for about two and a half hours. They were playing these deep cuts like gone shooting, which you never thought you'd hear. If you want blood, it was amazing. The PR who was working with us then said he's never seen journalists enjoy a show as much as that. And I said, well, come on. But there was also a great moment during that interview where the three of them, and because these were sort of irreverent, funny questions, there was a lot of laughing going on. And and there was a knock on the door in the little hotel room we were in, which was actually filled with cigarette smoke by this point because they were all puffing away. And... um, it was the German PR who uh, was there who opened the door. And I thought, come on, you know, I don't want people coming in and I don't want the five minute call. But she said, look, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm, I've never heard so much laughing coming from an interview. Do you mind if I just sit in and listen? I went, yeah, go, fine. So, was, you know, that was a really lovely memory for me. And it was great fun. But I'll, I'll tell you another one quick story about another encounter that I like to recall. Um, I'm a friend of um, Andy, who's the guitar player in Travis, and um, he's the token hidden heavy metal headbanger in that band. Is he really? Uh, yeah, so when and I... And is he the one who's married to Ken? Is he married to Kelly McDonald? Is he, uh, that's the, no. That's the other... That okay. That's the base, that's the he was part. married to Kelly Right, McDonald's. okay. Thank you very no, much. No, All right. But uh, Andy... So Andy's this guy that when I interviewed Travis, I worked for other magazines like Q, when I interviewed them, we all got on well. And then... 
Andy was saying to me, you used to do stuff at Kerrang, didn't you? And blah, blah, blah. So we realised he's a big heavy metal fan. Yeah. And he said to me, he went to see ACDC somewhere like, you know, Glasgow or something. And uh, so they gave him backstage passes because he was in a band and everything and he was waiting there. And he said, I got so nervous because it's my favourite band. And then Brian Johnson comes out and says, oh, you know, gets introduced. And Andy said he started stuttering because he was all a bit, like, nervous. And Brian Johnson, being old from the old school, said, don't be shy, lad. Your mother certainly wasn't. Way! <laughs> so that innuendo isn't reserved just for their songs. It's all the time. And I always, I always knew there was a reason I liked Travis as well, even though I'm a metalhead, and that's just absolutely why. Uh, the, this book is called ACDC, for those about to rock. It's by Paul Elliott. Paul, if people want to follow you online, do you do the social media thing? Can people track you down on the web? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, they can't, because um, I, I run a very light touch on social media. Um, You're a ninja. Uh, all I ever do on social media is post ACDC videos and things like that when I'm drunk. That's, and uh, that's my, that's are, as far as I... There are worse things to do on social media than drunkly post ACD, ACDC videos. Let's get into that. The book is called For Those About to Rock. It's by Paul Elliott. It will be available as a virtual download from our own virtual bookstore in memory of 89 to 90 New Year's Eve, thundering down to the port. I'm playing out with Thunderstruck. Paul, it's been an absolute blast to speak to you today. Thanks very much. 